Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Last time we completed image-based lighting, which now can be used as the ambient light for the scene. In this video I'd like to do a few improvements to the image quality and fix a couple of issues that are causing some artifacts. First is the adjustment of sample direction for specular cube map. Normally the specular sample direction is the vector that we get by reflecting the view vector about the normal vector of the surface. But now we are calling this function that shifts this vector towards the normal vector for rougher surfaces. This should make sense because a fully rough surface doesn't really have a specular vector since it scatters the light in all directions. I'll make a screenshot so we can have a look at the difference. So this image is with the adjustment to the sample direction. Using only the specular direction, the difference is not immediately noticeable, but we can see that there is a clear difference by comparing the screenshots. So this image is without adjusting the specular vector. We can see that for metals with full roughness, it still looks a bit specular and is noticeably different from the rough nonmetals. With the adjustment, the rough metal surfaces look more like rough nonmetals, which is something you'd logically expect to happen. Here I made some renders in Maya using real ray tracing, and as we can see here, the rough metallic sphere looks the same as the nonmetallic one. However, it is still a matter of preference, and if your game requires a different graphical style, then it's perfectly fine to use different settings. I'll leave it with the adjustment to the specular vector. Next I'd like to fix an issue that you most probably already noticed, which is the presence of these white spots on surfaces that directly face the camera. It's more extreme for rough surfaces and fades out for smoother surfaces. And as you can see, it's everywhere. I got really lucky with this issue since I wouldn't have guessed right away what's causing it. However, I came across a solution by someone who was having this exact issue even before I had finished implementing IBL. So when I saw this in my renders, I knew exactly how to solve it. The issue is that we are using samplers with address mode wrap to sample from our textures. And the particular texture that doesn't go well with this way of sampling is the BRDF lookup texture. If we think about the fact that the issue is worst for rough surfaces that are directly facing the camera, that means that we are sampling from this corner of the texture. However, since we are using bilinear sampling, the sampled value depends on a weighted average of 4 pixels within the texture. When sampling from a corner, the other samples are taken from the outside of the texture and their value will depend on the address mode of the sampler. When using wrap mode, it will, as the name suggests, wrap around and sample from the other side of the texture. In our case, this would involve sampling from these corners, which would mix incorrect roughness and n.v values, causing the artifacts. Changing the address mode to clamp will make sure that the value remains consistent with bilinear sampling. We can set the address mode in the game engine globally like this, or locally where we create the root signature. I chose to set it globally as the default address mode for all samplers. With this update, we no longer see any white spots. Another issue that we notice is that rough metallic materials look a bit darker than rough nonmetals. This is because the irradiance from metals is entirely determined by the specular component of the lighting and we are not accounting for secondary bounces for rough surfaces. This paper provides a solution for this, which you can feel free to have a look at. Here I'm going to use its results to compensate for the loss of energy for the second light bounce. 
Enabling this, we can see that the metallic sphere here is a bit lighter now. Actually, let me set the startup position of the camera so we can make screenshots for comparison. So this is without the energy compensation term. And this is with the correction term. We can see a clear difference and it's also almost the same brightness as non-metals. In order to make them match even better, I'm going to reintroduce a typo that I made in one of the earlier videos and which was fixed later. And this is the addition of a cos theta term in the diffuse prefiltering function. We can see the diffuse prefiltered texture without this term here. And after re importing with the extra cos theta term, it looks like this. You can see that the brightness is a bit more concentrated. And it's somewhat darker than the fully rough specular texture. This is of course mathematically incorrect, but it results in a better match between metallic and non-metallic rough objects. I'm not entirely sure yet about this and may change it back again when we have implemented HDR tone mapping, which also affects the brightness of the scene. Here we can see that the entire scene also became darker after using the new diffuse texture. Again, please do experiment and compare on your own to see if you agree on the results or you can come up with other improvements. This was everything I wanted to add to the IBL code, so we can now try the other textures that we imported last time. I am re-importing these in order to use the new diffuse prefiltering method. And then I'll just open and copy each one to the proper folder for the test application. We can simply change the path in renderitem.cpp in order to use a different environment map. So here we see how the scene looks with a different image. One more thing that we can do is visualizing the environment map in the background. What used to be a common practice was that we would render a cube mesh around the camera and use the environment cube map to texture it. You would have to make sure that it would follow the position of the camera and that it wouldn't render over the other objects. And that's also where the name Skybox comes from. I'm going to exclude the building from the scene so that nothing is obstructing our view to infinity, or at least the far plane of the camera. There. Now we only have a few objects near the camera. Modern APIs like D3D12 make it easier to do it in a simpler way. 
We can take advantage of our post process step that renders a full screen triangle and the fact that we are using bindless resources and render a background image without the hassle of rendering a cube mesh. In order to do that, we only have to know the depth value of the scene in the post process shader so that we can use it to render the image at infinity. Using bindless resources, we only need a descriptor index, which we can pass using the shader constants. Using this index, we can access the depth texture and read from it to get the depth value of the current pixel position. We can even use this value as the output of the post-process step. We have to update the post-process root signature to contain two root constants instead of one. And then where we render the full screen triangle, we also pass the depth buffer index. The render looks black, but that's only because we are using a reversed depth buffer and have configured the camera's near and far planes in an unreasonable way. So we only see objects in the depth buffer when they are really close to the camera. Let's set more reasonable values for near and far planes so that the values in the depth buffer are spread a bit more evenly. Okay, that's better. Now in order to render the background, we have to unproject each pixel from screen space to world space, which will give us a vector we can use for sampling the environment cube map. Remember that we already have a shader function that's called onProject. Here we can see that if you'd pass the inverse of the view projection matrix, then it would return a vector which is basically a position in world space. For our post-process shader, which I'm going to edit in Visual Studio Code, we render the scene like we did before if the depth value is larger than zero. Also recall that because we are using a reverse depth buffer, a value of zero represents a point that's on or beyond the far plane of the camera, which is regarded as infinitely far. When the depth value is exactly zero, we unproject the pixel position to a world position using the inverse of view projection matrix, which is provided in the global shader data. We can use this position as a direction vector to sample from the environment cube map. We also use a small offset from the first MIP level in order to blur the image a tiny bit. Of course, in order to sample from a texture, we also need to attach a sampler to the pipeline. We can do this when the post-process root signature is created. We have done this a few times before, so I'm just going to copy and paste a few lines of code that define an array of samplers. We really only need the linear sampler though. Then we pass a pointer to this array and the number of samplers to the root signatures constructor. And we also have to add these in the post-process shader, which I can again copy and paste.
And this is what the scene looks like with the screen space skybox. Let's try another environment map. It doesn't look bad at all, eh? Although I see a little bit of artifacting here, and my guess is that it's because the final MIP level for fully rough specular texture might be too small, but I'm not sure since I haven't tried other texture sizes yet. Other than that, I think it looks quite good. And here's the last environment map, which makes me want to create a space game. One last thing we can do before wrapping up for today is using the energy compensation term for our direct lighting model as well. As we can see here, when direct lighting is enabled and we are using the Cook Torrent lighting for physically based rendering, the rough metallic objects appear darker again. We can copy this block of code and use it in the same way to apply a correction to the specular term. Of course we have to also sample from the BRDF lookup texture. and use the correct variable name for accessing the SRV index. With this term, the spheres match better in brightness. We can see this better if other lights are disabled. And that's about it for this video. I think it was fun to play with different settings and see their effects visually. As always, thank you for joining me. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.